Welcome to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is creating unity through music, but as I like to say, making connections through music with the intention of bringing peace. And today, I am in Staten Island, New York, and so very privileged and pleased to be able to take some time and talk with amazing musician Bob Franceschini. Bob, thank you so much for taking hey, time. Hey, Jefferson. Thank you for coming over to my house, <laughs> making it easy. <laughs> I just got back from a long, uh, from a three-week tour of Europe, and it was it was incredible. It was with Victor Wooten and Dennis Chambers, uh, and uh, it was it was it was the best tour we've done in the last three years of touring. It was wow. amazing. Yeah, but it was over, a lot of work. I got back. I was I was feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> all over Europe, Istanbul. Eastern Europe. That's right. Istanbul, Czech Republic. And then we then and we went over to Western Europe and did all the major spots. Yeah, I was I, I saw the I followed the tour a little bit on uh oh, you know, cool. on internet. At least I knew where kind of where you oh, were cool. going. Yeah. It was wild. And then you got back and you had a gig last night. Yeah, I took a gig a while ago, not thinking that <laughs> I got back, I would probably be exhausted. And I, uh, you know, so this is like a real typical musician thing. You know, we 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 have to take whatever gets offered, you know, to, to make things work. Because sometimes yeah. things get slow, you know, so you never know. And um, I took the gig and I went and did this, I, uh, well, we call them club dates or casuals where you play at a wedding or a, some kind of a function, like a function type gig. Uh-huh. It was one of the top bands in New York City that they, they do this kind of things. Beautiful place in, in Tribeca. And, and uh, the, gig was, the gig was actually pretty nice. And the problem was I, I made the mistake of not driving in. I figured, oh, let me not drive into the city and deal with that. When I, when I, when I got out of the gig, it was about 12.30, and I figured take public transportation home, which is usually not a problem. Uh-huh. And, I, and it just was a nightmare, one thing after another. Oh. Trains not running, taking, having to take buses to make another train station. And by the time I got home, it was about 4 a.m. Oh, boy. So, yeah, so, so it's a musician's life, you know. <laughs> we, we, uh, we're talking about, about the spiritual aspect of it, and this will test that. Uh-huh. When you're that, you know, you're that tired, and by all normal standards, you should your your performance should be under par because you're so tired, right? Mm-hmm. But I think because of the spirit of music and 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 the nature of of where sound comes from, it doesn't matter if you're super tired. Wow. Sometimes it's even better. Wow! Because you get out of your way a little bit more. That's amazing. Yeah. So some of the best music we've made has been under circumstances where we're absolutely just exhausted. You know? Oh, man. And you get the energy to get through the gig somehow. After the show, after the set, you're like, how did we do that? How was that? How did we just do that? You know, <laughs> That's so, a good question. You know, so, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a testament to this energy that we uh, tap into when we're, when we're, we're open to it. Wow. You know, it's amazing. So, so it's an wow. amazing thing. Well, uh, I, I met you at uh, Victor Wooten's Music and Nature Camp in July, and then you were at Theory Camp in the mm-hmm. in uh, September. And, uh, you know, really just been amazed and saw you play in Georgetown recently. Oh, yeah. Just, right. you know, amazed by what you put out there. But I'm always interested in how this music thing came into your life and mm. whether you uh, you know did you have music in your family growing up or what kind mm. of attracted you did you take lessons what was kind of the trajectory that you were on from as early as you can remember not I mean not every gig that you did ever did or something but just sort of generally speaking how did that all happen and if when I think back on it now the an image that pops into my head right it's just a, a clear as day like if it was yesterday i was at my grandmother's house she used to take care of me while my parents were working and she lived next door to us we mm-hmm. lived in, in uh 
in Manhattan it's in, 19, in the 1960s, a, uh, a kind of working class area. You know, there was, there was uh, some people would say bad neighborhood. Um, it was a tough neighborhood. As far as I was concerned, it was beautiful. It was an awesome, it was racially very integrated. Um, people looked out for each other. There was a sense of community, even though it was completely racially mixed. So I, I grew up not even thinking about, you know, race. That didn't occur, probably, man, not, not till after high school that I start, like, you know, even noticing. hearing people talking about stuff like this. Yeah. You know, it was just, we, we grew up in such a, it's such diversity that it wasn't, it was not an issue. It was a non-issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and at an early age, my grandmother used to take care of me, and she had a piano. And she was a quiet woman, and, uh, and there was no grandfather in the picture. It was just her and her, one of her daughters, my aunt, and her kids. And they were a little older than me. So I was kind of left to my own devices. And I'd spend a lot of time at her piano. She had a little spin-up piano. Like how old and were she you? Played, uh, she played, I was about four, four, three or four years old three or four and I would make up stories on the piano I would I would have like the good guys and the bad guys and the <laughs> monsters and the, the <laughs> sitting there just kind of entertaining myself with, oh, wow. with these things and and occasionally my grandmother would come by and play a couple of she knew a couple of pieces like tea for two and uh, you know blue moon and those kind of you know simple yes, simple yeah. things she she knew them she, she could sit and, and and play a little bit and uh and so I would sit there, and after a while, I started to figure out the keyboard a little bit. So I could, I could, I figured out chords, and I figured out uh, using the black notes would change things. Mm. And so, so I sat there, and and I learned to play some pieces um, by ear. I learned some of the stuff my grandma was playing. I remember that. Mm-hmm. That just occurred to me that she showed me how to play. Um, a few things and then uh what's the one um dun, dun, chopsticks dun, 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 dun. yeah chopsticks <laughs> was the first one <laughs> like everybody right chopsticks yeah, i knew how to play that one that's a order. weird song isn't it <laughs> chopsticks yeah and uh and and so i got to music that way and I, at the same time i was doing a lot of artwork so i i was i was uh painting pretty good with yeah with drawing and uh. painting and i and i and I started uh, getting involved in that and won a few scholarships to go study at different different places. They had these little programs for... for Is this like I elementary guess underprivileged, school? Underprivileged I mean, kids. Elementary. It was elementary school. Yeah. Huh. Um, and I kept messing with music. We had friends that, um, that played, uh, like aunts of my best friends, and that she was a professional and... We had a few people, and and one of my best friends growing up, his dad owned a club. It was a nightclub, and it was a couple of blocks away. And we would hang out there during the day, and um, they had some Latin bands playing there, like Mongo Santa Maria, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, a whole bunch of Latin bands at that time. That they were like the small combo type things. They played at this place, so we'd be running around the club, and they would be rehearsing, doing their sound checks, and doing rehearsals. And uh, and I became fascinated with saxophone. Yeah, wow! So Just at an early age, yeah. And and uh, when I was probably about ten or eleven, I started listening to a lot of pop radio, and the saxophones always really grabbed me. So it, so when I got to junior high school at eleven years old, I, I I knew what I wanted to play. I had it in my mind that that's what I wanted to do. Wow, well, that's great. It's a real. And know, my brother had plus. started playing drums when I was a kid. My older brother. And so it was a thing. And he had a little band, a little combo. They did a lot of Santana music and stuff. <laughs> so it was in the house. My mom uh, danced flamenco, not professionally, but she was, she was really good at that. And both my parents uh, grew up um, at, doing a lot of dancing at the Palladium and places in New York Ooh. where the, where like Tito Puente and, uh, and Tito Rodriguez and... Machito and those kind of bands played. So my parents both grew up in Puerto Rico, so they were salseros. Uh-huh. They weren't called salseros at the time. The mambo dancers, mambo dancers—that's what it was called. <laughs> mambo dancers. <laughs> yeah. So they were good. 
Yeah. They were good. They were good dancers. And, uh, and so, yeah, music's been, was always present at home. My parents listened to a lot of music real loud all the time. And uh, they had a pretty vast listening, uh, a variety of things that they were really into. So beside the Latin music, they also loved Frank Sinatra and Barbara Streisand and all that kind of, uh, kind of swing influence pop music. Mm-hmm. And doo-wop was big at the house. Singing. Yeah, doo-wop, you know, listening to, to, to all those early groups and and then and then huge was Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. Oh, that I was, remember that. that was me. Yeah. And did you? When did you start? I assume you took lessons starting at some point in there. I uh, started playing saxophone on my own at, in junior high school, and I I guess since I since I had figured out the keyboard, it was pretty easy to figure out. I already knew what notes were. So it, it came pretty fast. I figured out how the saxophone was like a keyboard in a really weird way. And uh, so I was playing right away. I was able to play immediately. Wow. Like within two weeks, I was playing. That's amazing. That was weird. <laughs> and then uh, um, the music, there were, there were two music teachers at the junior high school, and both of them were fantastic musicians. And they, they, they both took an interest in, in my uh, playing and encouraged me a lot. And, uh, and one of them lived next door to one of the top studio musicians in New York. There's a guy named Dave Tofani. He's still around and still considered one of the top saxophone teachers around. And his students were professionals. And since, he, since this teacher of mine, Martin Kirschenbaum, lived right next door to him, they got to talking and he told them about me. He took me on as a student when I was just oh, sweet. 12. 12? 13 years old and uh so that was a that was very fortunate because he he set my trajectory right from the beginning in terms of beautiful getting getting right at the right source material for listening to jazz and saxophone and so i got a sound concept together early on and uh even though i didn't have a lot of harmony knowledge and and the the detailed stuff I had a really good sound concept, and I and I could emulate things without good knowing ear. what I was doing. Yeah, I guess what was would be considered a good ear early on. So, and then so when, since, when did you start playing in in groups? What kind of what kind of groups? So and how yeah, I- that was the thing when I uh, when it came time for high school. Um, Dave Tofani he helped me with the audition stuff. And I got into a high school that's called, at the time it was called Music and Art High School. And now it's it's called Fiorello LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts. Mm-hmm. And my kids go there now. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> so my, my 17-year-old and my 14-year-old both there. And, uh, and I got into, in, got into the high school and, and I started working. I started gigging at about 16. Wow, just so all I could around to it really Manhattan. fast. Yeah, I had only been playing about four, four or five years, and 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 I was starting to do gigs. There were there were um, some local bands right on my block. There was a lot of like there were some Latin kind of combo things going on, church stuff. There was um, um, recitals from like I'd started taking lessons with. I had started taking lessons with this other guy that we did, a, I did a couple of recitals and, and the junior high school teachers hooked up some recital things. So at an early age, I started playing with musicians that I still play with today mm. that are still out there killing it. And we were like, we were about 12, 13 years old playing these like kind wow. of classical recitals. So I've got some deep connections with some, some, some musicians. Arturo O'Farrell, who's out there doing a lot of stuff. Yeah, we were just kids hanging out. And uh, his dad was a, um, a conductor, arranger, major, Chico O'Farrell. And uh, we'd be hanging, I'd be hanging at Arturo's house and um, there were all these musicians hanging out and we had no idea. I mean, I had no idea who they were, but it was like Dizzy Gillespie, <laughs> no. Clark Terry, 
Uh, oh people, my goodness. People wow. who, you, who you, you know, you just, they're the masters of the music. And it was just a very organic situation. You know, they'd come in and, and joke around, mess around with us. You know, oh, I don't play that, you know. No, nah, man, you got to learn some <laughs> tunes, man. You know, <laughs> we'd be practicing some kind of like little recital thing. And uh, they were awesome. They were totally, totally awesome. And uh, it's so, uh, so I did get like this kind of concentrated stuff from all these New York musicians when early on. And, you know, you're like a sponge at that age. Yeah. So, so I, I was fortunate that way. So, so I started gigging while I was still in high school and I got uh, lucky and I, and I started playing professionally with Eddie Palmieri, who's a great uh, pianist, writer, conductor, genius, mm -hmm. with, with some great musicians in that band. So that was lucky, right, right off the bat. And they would push me to, to, to just play and, and improvise. So early on, there was a place called, uh, there was a club called the Village Gate, and they had Monday nights. It was called Salsa Meets Jazz. So it would be a hot major salsa <laughs> band, salsa, whatever you call it, Latin jazz salsa band, with a guest soloist, famous jazz musician. And he would come in and just solo with the, with the band. You know, they'd just figure out which tunes they could easily sure. come in and play over. But then it became like a challenge, or challenge at a cer certain point where some of the guys in the band would kind of have like a duel with whoever the soloist was. <laughs> so here I am, like a 17-year-old kid, and uh, there was a great, he's still around, he's still, still amazing, Ronnie Cuber, great baritone saxophone player. And I was kind of shy, and he was like, go up there and kick his ass, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. So, you know, it was a challenge at 17 to go up and play against some amazing guy, you know. And it, it was like, I was futile, but, you know, I would give it my best. Wow, that's you know, fabulous. And, so it, it would just, you really were immersed in it. it. It wasn't any question. That's what you were doing. Yeah, I didn't question it at all. It and just so, kind of took, And then you, took, I mean, sort of generally speaking, you, you went on, you played with, ended up playing with Paul Simon and mm -hmm. all, all these, you've just been doing this your whole life. Yeah, it's just been a nonstop ride. It's been a minute. Yeah, it's like you pay one price and then you just don't get off. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's fabulous. Um, and you've been playing, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day because of the tour you were on. I mean, Victor is arguably one of the best, the best bass players in the world. Dennis yeah, Chambers is Unless there's some other world going on of people <laughs> that we are not aware of, he is. He's you know sometimes I kind of have to pinch myself because I'm yeah. like, wait a minute, and Dennis this Chambers is actually you I've, know one of the actual best bass players in history. You know, right, and, we're, and, we're, and I'm playing with him. It's weird. And Dennis Chambers, who some too. friends have said, oh my God, he's one of the best players in the world, <laughs> and there you are, and doing all these gigs and and. You know, powering through it, and I mean, what 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 is what's going on with that? What is that? You, that's it's a it's an it's a it's an interesting experience in that the the energy that happens is beyond our control. It's something that happens when you're playing. Yeah, when we're when we're playing, it's it's not us at that point. On a good day, on a good day, uh -huh. it's not us. We just we're we're just just letting the music flow, wow. and you can you can almost watch it as another person, you know, like an outside yeah, yeah. of yourself watching it. Out of happen. body experience, yeah. You get these. You get. I guess what people get through meditation or something like this, where you where you feel um, you're not aware of thinking and not aware of you're not planning you're not making decisions uh in the in the normal day-to-day -day kind of decision making process and so it's it's a it's a it becomes 
I guess, I don't know if spiritual is the right word for it, but it's the closest word I can think of. It's like a spiritual experience at that point. Well, when we saw you play with Mike Stern in Georgetown, Blues Alley, I mean, I was just sitting there at several points, eyes closed, just taken off somewhere <laughs> with the music. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching you, you'd finish a solo, and it was like you had just put everything out there that you had at the moment. Mm. nothing left on the table and mm. just really really doing it it was so like i say powerful. it's not something you do on purpose it's not something that's predetermined and it's not like i'm pushing myself it's an interesting thing after you take this after you play you you look back and i i, I like to tape the gigs because at the moment, I have no idea if it was good, bad, if the audience liked it, if they didn't like it, if, if, it, if it was a, a good performance at all. I have no idea. And sometimes if I'm in a certain state of mind, I'll, I'll take a solo and say, oh, that kind of sucked. And then afterwards, people will pick that particular <laughs> solo. Oh, that solo you took on the ballad tonight, was it just was so moving, and they'll get really deep, and I'll say, you know what? Let me just not, I can't judge, you know, let me not judge what I do. Because, yeah. And the opposite is also true. You think you nailed something. I'll take something. a solo and I'll be like, yeah, I did, <laughs> I did this and I did that harmonic thing or that rhythmic thing and it was so hip and it worked so great. Mm. And, you know, the people <laughs> weren't moved. You know, so usually the case is when I'm, when I'm, uh, when I'm feeling that I didn't really get to the, th let's say the intellectual stuff that I'm working on uh -huh. and I didn't get to it or didn't nail it, you know, the way I practiced. It's usually when people really like it the most. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So you have so to let go. You have played for hundreds of thousands of people maybe. Yeah. And you played with, <laughs> more musicians than you can even yeah. re remember. Well, one of the biggest ones I remember just offhand that you say hundreds of thousands. We literally played for hundreds of thousands of people uh, one time. It's on YouTube now. Somebody put it up. It was an old airport in Venezuela, and they converted the run runway into a stage. <laughs> and they had these delay speakers so that people all the way at the end of this ocean of people could still see the concert. And that was with Ruben Blades and Willie Colon. And it was, that was something. Just an ocean of people. As far as your eye could see, it was people. Wow, it's beyond It's out words. there, it's on YouTube, it's on YouTube. So so <clears throat> millions of people you played with. Probably millions now. <laughs> what? Uh, 40 know, years, you, I've been touring for 40 you, years. You, so you've talked about, you know, sort of that power that flows through you. What is it, I mean, it affects all those hundreds of thousands of people, those millions of people, mm. they see it, they're, they're affected, transformed, they go to different places. And the musicians, what, how, could you, how do you describe what that power is that is affecting the audience or other musicians? Right. Well, I don't know if the right word is power. It's more like peace. Mm. It's like a sense of tranquility that, that when you, when you, when you're there, there's, it's not a sense of power at all. Because like I said, you have to let go. Mm -hmm. And so letting go in itself is not what we would normally identify as power. Right, true. Power, power to me implies control. Yeah. I'm controlling this power, right? And it's the opposite. The music is connecting you with the audience and maybe that's the, the power or the... Yeah. It's a circuit. Let's this, put it that way. Yeah. It's more like a circuit board. Uh -huh. It feels in a way, in a way. It's like a you connect it, and you're you're in the and the and the, and the energy is flowing. You, know? you tap into it. It's there. You just fall into it. Yeah. 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 And and the the uh, audience and the musicians on stage all want it to happen. So I think it's a matter of this kind of unification of intention where they're here to see something amazing. 
we're here to to see if we can you know yeah. let it happen and between all of us like we conjure an, it up an intentional like a connectivity yeah oh it's phenomenal yeah it's tremendous well, let me ask a little bit about also just um victor um i in on the copy of the music lesson book that i have your name is on the front with a little quote oh that's right and so you when did you first meet victor and he, i mean he's he's been on this this path with the music camps and the, and the the you know the music lesson he's got another book coming out all this yeah how did you tie in with him and how is that mm. kind of relationship with i mean he's just having been to the the camps down there in wooten woods there's something really pretty pretty good going on there was there was a an engineer that mike stern i played with mike stern guitarist mike stern for 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 a while and he used this kid to do sound as he was subbing for our regular sound guy and he would he would equalize the sound system every day with the same track, which was Victor Wooten's. And it was, uh, what did he say? What did he say? And, mm -hmm. and uh, I had no idea who Victor Wooten was. And What year was that about? This was uh, 2003, mm -hmm. maybe, two, maybe. I got to look and see when that record came out. But... Uh, he was a bass player, and he loved Victor. So, so during during the sound checks, he would be playing this rec show of hands. That was the name of the oh, record. Oh yeah, right. I thought it was overdubbed. <laughs> yeah. And then he explained to me that he he did all that that, that Victor had played that live. I was like, no way. There's no way that that's played <laughs> live. And uh, <clears throat> Mike Stern became a fan as well just from listening to the soundcheck music. And he somehow, Mike, made a connection with, with Victor. And Victor joined us on, on a tour. And that was, I guess, I'm going to guess it's 2002. Mm -hmm. It had to be around 2002. And, uh, and, and so it started then. And, uh, and, I, uh, and so, so my connection with him, every time we got together, it was, I just felt just so much positive energy from this guy. Mm. And, and, and I, when he started writing the book, the music lesson, I was, I was making notes to writing something. And I approached him to, with what I was doing and showed him some sketches of what I was doing. And he said, I'm doing something very, very similar. Wow. And he showed me a copy of, you know, early His versions like of the book. like a manuscript, book. sort of. Yeah, the yeah. manuscript wow. that he was working on. It was like a little spiral-bound thing. Did he with hand notes write it? In it? It was all typed. Yeah, all it was typed. typed. Yeah. And I started reading, and I was like, "Well, he's thought this through a little bit better than I have." <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Because he took it, it took the form of a novel, more like a novel than a. I was writing a regular music book thing, but using the same concept of picking out the elements of music and going through it step by step uh -huh. with each element. And the elements I chose were almost identical to the ones that he had chosen as his top mm. 10 for that book. Right, yeah, I know that. It was, it was interesting. So at that point, I think, I think we made a connection then with my feedback on his book and, and all that kind of stuff. And so it led to some interesting conversations and things. And so that's when our... our uh, Collaboration started in 2002. And did you start going to the camps then as teacher? I or? think it was, uh, well, it's an interesting story. And, 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 and there was some tragedy involved. In 2006, um, um, I was married to, uh, to an Italian woman that passed away in 2006. Mm. And... Uh, and at that time, Victor's manager reached out, uh, Danette, to see how I was doing. Because I had now I had two kids to raise, and I was in Italy. We were living in Italy at that time. Wow. And she became very proactive, involved in helping me out with 
logistics and caring for the kids, you know, talking to them on the phone and all this kind of stuff. And eventually, we ended up getting together, and we are now married. We've been married. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> wow. And so that was through Victor. And then so that connection with Victor got tighter at that point. Yeah. So it became more like family. And, and uh, his kids and my kids, he has two kids that are the same age as my two kids. Mm -hmm. you know, I have an older, an older kid, too. He lives in Florida. He's, th he's almost 30 years old. Um, but uh, um, so the kids became tight, and uh, it, so it became like a family type of a thing. Wow, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So then the the book came out, he started doing those camps and you began to be an instructor there. That's right. In 2010 was my first time he asked me to come and and help out at theory camp. It was a, it was if not the, his first there maybe it was his first theory camp. I'm not sure. But being a being a um an arranger and a jazz musician, I guess he figured I qualified to teach theory, <laughs> and <laughs> oh, yes. So I went down, and and that was the year that there was this major flood. So there was this, you know, I'm a city boy. We're driving to the camp, and it's raining, and it was it was coming down so heavy that biblical you could, type. It was like yeah, you could not <laughs> see in front of you. It was like being under a waterfall, and I'm like, is this normal? Is that rain down here, man? <laughs> You know, this doesn't happen in New York City. But, and he's like, mm, I think this is this is more than normal. We drove to, we could barely get to the camp. And because um, everything was flooded out, and we passed over this. They've changed the road a, a quite a bit since. Oh, since it, a little. Back then there was a little, was a little sketch here. <laughs> yeah. And so we had to cross this little, this little bridge. And it was. You know, we just scooted over it, and and we got there, and there were campers already there, and it, it was starting to really get a little crazy. The water started coming off the side of the hills there. It was rushing down the center of the camp like a river. Ooh. You couldn't go from one building to another without transportation, without without a jeep. You couldn't get across from you know you've been to the yeah. barn to the woodshed. You oh had to God. literally go in a jeep. You could not cross oh, it. It's hard to That's imagine. <laughs> So that was my first experience at camp. And Victor carried on, and he just took all the campers. After we got rescued, we went to Victor's house and did the theory camp at his house. So there were 20-something people, along with some of his neighbors that had gotten flooded out of their house that were camping at his house. He's got this cabin, you know, this big, beautiful cabin. So imagine that. It's like... It was, uh, it was, uh, that was a great first camp because it was like a, it was memorable, totally <laughs> amazing. So, you know, in addition to all the people that you've played in front of and all that, now you've been to a number of these camps and, mm -hmm. and I've been to two and it's just, it's a, it's such a perspective on music and playing and, and all music and nature and the spirit and everything. I mean, how do you, how would you describe what what he has going on sort of with his book and his musical natural philosophy and the way that he you know just touches people and how it how that all gets put together hmm. the first camps that i went to i was f fortunate to meet his mom and i came down with my kids and 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 my wife Danette, and she just was so warm and such a, just a, a wise person. I mean, I can't uh, say that I've ever met anybody quite like her. Mm. And um, so I see her spirit coming through in Victor. There's an energy to this family. Victor's brothers, his older brothers, each of them are like, very, very unique and special. Mm -hmm. And so he's kind of lightweight compared to them. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, isn't it? <laughs> so, so if you have the mom and then the brothers, I didn't get to meet his dad. And there was one brother that passed away this, the, before I got to meet him, which was uh, the saxophone player. I yeah. wish I had gotten to meet Rudy. Ooh, yeah. Rudy would have been awesome to, to get to know. So without, it's not, not to belittle Victor, 
but he's really not the heaviest one in the family to my in what I, what I can understand for what's going on. So he's kind of like a spokesman for uh, that's what's a, happening. There. That's a good way to think of it. Because when I interviewed him. It's a great him, spokesman. When I interviewed him, he said, well, you should talk to Reggie and Roy. They're the smart ones. That's right. You know, my, talk to my other brothers. Um, yeah, whenever they speak at camp, I always record it. So I've got all these lectures. And one of them is like three and a half hours long. Yeah, they can. Yeah. Reggie went on yes. one time for three and a half I think it was three and a half hours, if I'm, if I'm not remembering. I've seen a couple of fairly long. He, yeah, they'll just keep going, and 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 the audience is with them. Yeah, and then and then Victor will step in and say, "Okay, we gotta like move on here," and, <laughs> and they always go, "Just one more thing," <laughs> <laughs> so it's, they can go, they can really go. They're not just speaking; they get actual results. I've seen. Students go into one of Reggie's classes and come out on the other side playing their instrument like never before. I mean, like just jamming away and playing and grooving hard. And, and you know, I'm talking about young musicians that with, without a lot of experience. You see, somehow he, he, he puts, he puts the, the spirit of the whole thing in them in a, in a, in a very unique way. Maybe it'll work for old people. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm I think it on works it. for I'm everybody. Yeah. I think it works for everyone. So, yeah, he's pretty amazing. It's, and 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 so is Joseph, you know, and yeah. and and, uh, and Roy. And, and I wish I had met. Like I said, I wish I had met Rudy. And uh, um, so Victor, I mean, he's he's a tr tremendous spokesman, though. He puts it together. He puts in it together in a really yeah. great way. Yeah, he's he's got a. He's got a it's beautiful, phenomenal. beautiful way to, to to convey his message. I mean, that book and the things that I've learned or I've been exposed to at the camps have just really made a difference in my life. Um, what do you think that we can do, musicians, people who like music, which is everybody on the planet, but to try to help overcome this, some of the difficulties that we have um, as Victor says, you know, 90% of the, your your day is perfect and fine. And then mm -hmm. sometimes there's these little things and we're dealing with mm. a lot of sort of fears and resentments around the, around the world and mm. governments and all these things. I just got to believe there's a way that humans can kind of, you know, take it up a notch or move it a notch or whatever it is to do. Mm. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that? I've been, I've been touring for for like 40 years now, over 40. Victor has talked about this in, in concert a, couple, a few times where no matter where we're playing, people are beautiful. People are just so amazing, you know, and, and, and um, so maybe I wish more people would travel, more people would see other cultures and, and get a feel for the world that's not filtered through some media source or some, some, uh, uh, you know, internet, whatever, just some direct, some direct contact with people all over the world to see that, that we're really in a, in a miraculous place. I think all over the world in general, I don't give into, you know, watching news and the whole, like CNN versus Fox versus this versus that. When when I watch that stuff, to me, it's it's a form of masochistic entertainment to me because it doesn't have anything to do with reality to me. Right. It's right. like a it's like a forced reality, and it's set set with a. I think that the the intention of it is not a positive one. I don't think there's a positive intention, even though people like to speak their minds. And that, I think that's a good thing that people come out and speak their minds. But I just think that in general, uh, the world is in, a, is in a better state than we think that it's, that, that then we're led to believe through media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Because even like you say, I've played in countries where there's serious poverty, third world, let's call it fourth world places. And when you talk to the people there, they're very, very happy in 
in and a general their general state of being yeah. is one of of peace with it. They're okay. Like, things could be better for sure. You know, I mean, it would be better. It'd be great to have clean water. <laughs> yeah. have, uh, you know, not be uh, you know uh, dying from having the flu or something like this. But um, but there's a there's this. Uh, there's a, I think, a, a lot of people who who assume that people who are not living like them in the first world are unhappy, miserable. They need to be saved, or, or, or not, need to or be, not good people, or unworthy, people. or something. Yeah. So, so in general, I think it would be great if people got out in the world and and actually had direct contact with other people. That's first. And then, as a musician, you know, I just see the unification of humanity through music. Because it doesn't matter what country we play in, people are getting down and grooving with music. You know, and it doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter to them that we're American or black or white or whatever you want to say. It's just what it is, it's music. And the music unifies, unifies. It's it's one of the few things that we all there's no war talk we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to learn it. We don't have to understand it technically and it just gets right in. Yeah. And so I think there's a, there's some kind of power there. And and and, and you know, the, the interesting thing is if you get into a geeky kind of sci- science looking at things and 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 pondering the nature of of uh how the universe is built, you know, you look at things uh, like string theory or super string theory or whatever. All right. Einstein's theories based on this unifying vibration. It's a vibrational system. The whole system is vibrational. Yep. And when you're manipulating vibrations in the way we do with music, it has to have some kind of a, it's got to run pretty deep. When you're manipulating these vibrations into something that's aesthetically pleasing, that's for sure. Right? There's, so there's got to be some some uh, connection that with the universe that's unique. Yes. And unifying. I think it's a unit. It's a force for unification. Yeah. Well, that runs against what some a lot of people don't want unification. Right? They want things divided. They want things clearly divided. Us and they want to them. Pro- they want to promote division that's the promotion of division is the opposite of music so unfortunately um, it seems that th- they've got a really loud voice you know but I don't think they are the majority of the world they're just loud minority True. yeah the loud very loud minority yeah people who just want to People who just want to enjoy this beautiful, amazing planet, amazing. hang out with friends and it's play amazing. music and, and soccer and <laughs> stuff so like that. Incredible. And what you talk about with the traveling, um, well, you know, this whole effort we're doing here with Planetary Gigs is mm-hmm. more gigs around the planet. You know, how do we do that? It's got to gotta help. And, you know, being able to talk with you, being, a, being associated with so many amazing musicians and people who are doing this and having their voices you know contribute to this conversation is uh it's a it's it's an amazing thing that's going on for me an amazing experience i'm so privileged Mm -hmm. to do that but do you have any other kind of thoughts that you might want to throw out there i think what what you've been talking about is really profound some of the things that you've said are so well said good you know to try to understand what this what this thing is you know Mm -hmm. it's um just pretty phenomenal i think um conversations with musicians tend to be well primarily comedy (laughs) it's primarily comedy (laughs) From the, for, you know, it's like uh, 
we have a lot of time to kill and we have to we have to travel together and uh, and do all this stuff and so a primary part of, of of the whole deal is everybody having a very good sense of humor you know because you're you're putting up with some really kind of sometimes logistically really crazy situations right. but if you get negative it would be a drag yeah but if you if you keep a sense of humor about about the whole thing you get through it and really have an amazing time regardless and so that's primary but again um i think that we have a certain amount of time on our hands and of course, you know, you're going to ponder the deeper questions in life, the existential questions in life. And can be, we have the privilege of having this kind of time and getting into these kind of conversations are pretty common as opposed to, you know, if you're doing a nine to five thing and yeah. you're just working, oh, yeah. right. it kicks your ass. And there's, you know, by the time you have a chance to hang with friends, you just want to look. Like, throw down and just like lose your mind you don't want to right. get too deep so so we we get to uh have a little bit more time on our hands to do that that kind of thinking and conversation and you, you'll find that a lot of musicians will tend to be um, um kind of deep thinkers about existential issues mm -hmm. so it's an interesting thing i think it comes through in the music as well so that there's this sense of of uh of wonderment and uh, excitement about living. There's That's a, a joy. Good thing. There's a joy to to life. That's a good mm -hmm. thing. Um, yeah, spreading that joy through music. Well, Bob, I really want to thank you very much for for taking the time. I know you just got off a gig. Well, you were I up think late you're. Last I think night. you're on a tremendous mission, and I'm all for it. And anytime you need anything, just reach out. You know, well, if you need a connection with with other musicians that you that you think I'm, you know, I, I pretty much between me and Danette, we've got contact with just about anybody on the planet. Well, so you know, feel free to reach out, and and uh, it's always interesting. I can't wait to sit and listen to some of these. Yeah, there's some, yeah. there's some good stuff, and you know, I've said many times, I could interview everybody on the planet about the power of music, the impact of music. Everybody has their own versions of the wheels on the bus go round and round and mm. lullabies and all those mm, things that we just, right. chopsticks, all those things that we know. Mm. And so it's just, um, you know, it's something we all share. It's just so powerful. I mean, we kind of are music in many ways. Mm. And maybe the more we can mm. realize how, how much it is us and how much it provides that connection and joy, we'll be better off. Well... I think you're right, and uh, and you're doing something very positive for that. I think that I think it's a it's a matter of awareness and intention. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're gonna keep at it. We will. We will. All we'll right. pass it on to the next generation. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That sounds cool. Okay, Bob. Right, thanks Jeff, very much for the time. Really, yeah. really appreciate you're it. You're very welcome. You've been listening to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society. We talk with musicians and others about the power of music and how we can use music to help create a better world. Please check out our website, www.planetarygigs.org, for information about some of the organization's promoting music and musicians, resources about the power of music, books, movies, articles, including new research on music and the brain. We welcome your support. The Planetary Gig Society is a Section 501c3 charitable organization, and you can donate on the website. You also can receive a free email signature block demonstrating your support for Planetary Gig Society. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Planetary Gigs. And we want to thank fabulous musician and teacher Eric Weinberg 
of Little Eric Studios for the Planetary Gig Talk music titled Chill Kid, It's Saul. So please check out Planetary Gig Talk on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Subscribe and hear all the upcoming episodes. Thanks very much.